um, our first MX seminar of the year, and it's actually a great way to start our seminars off with having um, Joseph here as a guest. So let me just give you a little bit of a brief background to Joseph. Um, Joseph Dana, as some of you might know, is a journalist writer. He's based in Ramallah, and he reports on, well, across the region. And one of the reasons why we looked to bring Joseph up was I've actually been reading his work for years. And in, even in terms of my own research, my own thinking, my own understanding of the situation, it's really um, shaped and influenced how I read and understand the situation. And what Joseph does so powerfully is to capture what's happening on the ground, report what's happening. Um, he was one of the founders of, as some of you might know, the 972 online journal. And he will actually just speak more to his, his own experience, which is actually a really fascinating experience in terms of how he locates and understands his journalism. His own experience of his Jewish identity, his um, moving to Israel, how that shaped his, his understanding of the situation. And um, also in terms of how that shifted and, and shifted in terms of how he is now narrating the situation. But beyond, beyond the research on, on Israel and Palestine, he's actually just come directly from Cairo. So um, the talk tonight, though, is focused on, on Israel and Palestine. It's against solutionism and the politics of the status quo. So what's going to happen, Joe is going to speak for about 25 minutes. And then after that, we're going to have some questions, discussion, engagement around that. So um, if you don't mind starting. And thanks so much, and um, welcome to everybody. You know, and thanks for being here. Well, it's really great to be in South Africa and have this lovely, intimate boardroom type of setting that we have here. And I really have to thank the, the center here, and especially Haiti, for organizing everything. It's been a very smooth experience so far, and now we're really kicking off the, the proper events. Um, and so I will talk a little bit about um, these pesky politics of the status quo in a second, but I just want to kind of place myself in this whole situation and tell you a little bit about how I arrived uh, at being a, a journalist based in Ramallah. Um, I'm an American Jew. I was born, raised, cultured in the United States. And, um, you know, Jewish identity was something that was always very profound uh, as I was growing up. My, my great-grandmother was actually the national president of Hadassah, which is one of the world's biggest Zionist women's organizations. So Zionism had a subtext in, in our home growing up, but it, it wasn't the driving factor. Um, I, I, I did a, a high school program in Israel as, as a teenager. It was a really exciting experience, and I came back pumped up on that very particular form of Jewish nationalism, uh, which everyone around here has probably encountered at some point in their lives. Um, but I went back to my life in the United States, and I, I realized in my early 20s that I wanted to pursue uh, a career in Jewish academia. And I wanted to specifically investigate questions of um, the relationship between Jews and modernity. What does it mean to be a Jew in the modern Christian secular world? Uh, naturally, Zionism is one reaction to this very problematic question, and so I began focusing not on Zionist issues, but more on um, kind of European, specifically German Jewish writers, Franz Kafka, Walter Benjamin, this, this struggle, this tension with, with modernity, and also this wrestling with what it means to be a minority, what it means to be on the outside of, of the majority uh, in whatever country uh, the Jews have found themselves in. And so this led me to a first degree in Jewish history, and then I realized after this that I, like I said, that this Jewish identity was a driving aspect in my life, and that Israel is an unavoidable um, issue in facing the Jews. Uh, and so I decided, after a bit of wrestling, that I would immigrate to Israel, acquire Israeli citizenship, and learn Hebrew, and learn the society from the inside. And again, this wasn't necessarily driven out of some fanatical belief in Zionism or, or Jewish nationalism. It was more, this is the issue facing the Jews. I consider my Jewishness to be an incredibly important part of my life, and therefore I must go inside and understand what was going on. So I immigrated to Israel. 
I continued my, my Jewish studies education at the Hebrew University, um, studying Jewish philosophy. And living in Jerusalem, I was kind of confronted with a, a brick wall, as it were. I went there wanting to have this great discussion about what it means to be a Jewish minor, you know, a minority as a Jew, what it means to be on the outside. And I found um, you know, that there weren't that many people talking about these issues in Israeli society, that what was dominating the discourse was, was typified by a certain nationalism, which, was, uh, which I realized was increasingly at odds with the values that I had in the United States. Um, and so this was a very difficult process, uh, but it allowed me to, to start to think about what was going on vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians and specifically inside of the West Bank. I went there as I would classify myself as a liberal Zionist, uh, as a centrist Zionist, concerned with the Palestinian situation, uh, naturally, but not, it wasn't driving my, my everyday thought and my politics and whatnot. But living there and confronting these issues of, uh, of not having someone to talk to about Franz Kafka or, or Jewish identity or being on the outside, uh, allowed me to start thinking about what was going on in the West Bank. And so I met some Israeli activists uh, at the University in Jerusalem um, and started to accompany them to the West Bank. Um, they would go out normally on Saturdays and accompany Palestinian farmers that would have a, hor a horrific time dealing with the Israeli military as they would take their, their goats and sheep to, to, to kind of to herd. Um, and I found the experience to be incredibly profound and emotionally uh, jarring. And one of the ways that I reacted to it is that I started blogging about it. Um, and I started tweeting about it. Uh, this was right as Twitter was starting to like really kick off. Uh, and I developed, because this issue is so interesting to so many people around the world, I developed a, a pretty quick following uh, that kind of spiraled serendipitously into more focused writing on what was going on and increasingly less attention on my... Uh, Jewish academic career. Um, and so then I met some like-minded uh, kind of Israeli leftists, center leftists, um, also working as journalists. I mean, at that time I wasn't working as, as a journalist. I was still dabbling in all, what all of this kind of meant, especially the significance of social media and whatnot, which we can talk about uh, later if you want. Um, and we started 972 very much as a, as a project that we didn't think would succeed. Uh, and I used that as a platform to continue being in the West Bank. Uh, like I said, initially as an activist, but I realized that I wasn't a very good activist, nor did my, um, my heart lie in activism. Uh, while I was there because of Jewish identity, I didn't feel like an Israeli, even though I had an Israeli passport. I didn't feel like a Palestinian because I'm not a Palestinian. And so I had a hard time uh, and attention with being an activist and fighting for this this cause that I didn't really identify with on either side or being an advocate of this. Uh, and so I moved out of activism um, and, and started just writing and focusing, you know, admittedly from a left perspective uh, on what was going on and reporting from the ground consistently, uh, especially using social media and whatnot. So the long story short, what I often tell people when they ask me why are you an American Jew with an Israeli passport living in Ramallah is that I moved to Israel to discover a certain conversation, a narrow conversation about Jewish identity and what it means to be a Jew in the modern world. And I found that conversation not in Israel, but in Ramallah and in Palestine. Because among Palestinians, and specifically Palestinian intellectuals, I found people that were wrestling with what it meant to be on the outside, with what it meant to be on the periphery. And that was something that was incred incredibly stimulating and exactly what I was looking for. Um, Granted, it's not the Jewish context, but it's a context that very much speaks to, to the issues that I wanted to explore. And so I found myself, after living in Israel for four years, uh, moving to Ramallah, and that's where I've been ever since. And as I've decided to, over the specifically the last two, three years, just focus on journalism, it's taken me to the rest of the region uh, and reporting in, in various countries, um, especially Cairo, or especially Egypt, because that's, that's really one of the big uh, topics right now. And I'm also reporting on a variety of different issues, such as food and culture and urbanism and, and, and various things. Now, that's my hopefully somewhat short introductory statement about myself. And I wanted to talk about this issue of against solutionism, the politics of the status quo. Um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about here 
specifically on the politics of what's going on in Israel-Palestine last week, um, I noticed some comments that uh, Avigdor Lieberman, the outgoing uh, Israeli foreign minister who's now the subject of a very interesting corruption trial, which I would recommend everybody looking at just in terms of how the Israeli state operates and how politicians can get away with things and not get away with things, but that's off the side. Lieberman, I, I believe it was last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, he, he, he said that we don't think that the conflict is going to end, or we don't think that we have the ability to end it, or, 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 or the Palestinians have the ability to end it. We have decided, Israel, that we want to manage the conflict. And this is an incredibly important statement, because it really, in my opinion, in my estimation, based on my reporting, indicates a certain end game that Israel has been playing, or at least creating, uh, specifically since the Oslo period, in terms of managing a conflict with no intention of ending it, entrenching an occupation, creating facts on the ground um, that, that can't be changed, or at least they seemingly can't be changed. Um, and you also saw this in the comments of Naftali Bennett, the charismatic leader of the Jewish Home Party, who was one of the stars, or at least one of the most talked about people in the Israeli election that just happened in uh, late January. And in fact, this against solutionism, solutionism idea is a play on something he said about him, you know, kind of echoing Lieberman that there is no solution, we're dealing with the present, we're managing the conflict, we're, we're existing uh, in, in the now. Uh, and so what I see is that from the Israeli perspective, the situation that they've engineered in the West Bank um, is as good as it's going to get for them. It's manageable, violence is containable. Um, especially since um, the, the, the Second Intifada and in which, you know, in the creation of the wall and whatnot, in which Palestinian terrorism has been really brought down to such a, a, a kind of minimal level inside of Israeli cities. I'm talking about suicide terrorism, not necessarily uh, rockets from Gaza, which is another situation we can explore. Um, the occupation remains a very, very profitable um, endeavor. Uh, I just recently was working on some research uh, about a crane company in, in Europe uh, that apparently makes these very special cranes that the Israelis are buying in, in high numbers to complete the separation barrier. And so this European country, which I don't feel like naming, is making an incredible amount of money uh, off of what's going on on the ground. So this is a profitable situation. Um, and as um, as uh, Lieberman and, and, and Bennett have, have kind of alluded to, they're managing the conflict. Um, and they're basically getting away with it. Um, and I don't think that this issue is necessarily discussed enough in the international community. For, I, I don't know if I can comment on the South African media particularly, but especially in the United States, the question always invariably, whenever I'm talking, goes to what's the solution? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And because of that insistence on solutions, on what's going to happen, I think we miss the fact that, like I was saying, the Israelis are kind of laying their cards down and saying, you know what, we want to manage this, and this is the situation we find ourselves in, and that necessarily means no end to occupation. That means that the cold, bleak reality of the situation is that Israel administers a state from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean, in which some people have full privileges, some people have less than full privileges, and some people have no privileges or rights. Rights or privileges are interchangeable in the situation. Uh, and this isn't going to change. I had to pop back into Ramallah on my way here. I had no intention to go to Israel to do this. I live in, in, in Ramallah, but I had to go through Israeli border crossings because we are living in a de facto one-state reality. And I'll just tell you just a little anecdote because people don't often realize this. As an Israeli citizen living in Ramallah, I actually and this is kind of non sequitur, but I always find it interesting. I actually am a, a walking zone of Israeli sovereignty, right? Um, if I'm arrested for shoplifting or something by the Palestinian authority or Palestinian police officer, they can't try me. They can't, they can detain me and then hand me over to the Israelis. And so that would be like me being here as an American and me, you know, in this little area, only I, I would be responsible under American law. Right? It's, it's a very weird situation, but it, it demonstrates how this status quo operates and how the varying uh, you know, kind of levels of rights and privileges exist. You know, the Israeli Avigdor Lieberman, the outgoing foreign minister, lives outside of the internationally recognized boundaries of the Israeli state. 
Um, and so this is kind of one, of one of the issues. And I also find, well, this is something I want to stress, that when I was kind of researching... So, uh, even if it's area A, yeah. you, they still have sovereignty in area A. They don't have sovereignty over Israeli subjects. Technically, according to Israeli law, it's illegal for Israelis to be inside of Area A. But you're living in Area A. Right. I have an Israeli government-issued press card, so I'm allowed to be there. Um, but if I, but Israelis have been known to go into Area A. For example, in Nablus, where Joseph's tomb is. Is it Joseph's tomb? Yes, it's Joseph's tomb. Yeah. It's my namesake. I should know this. But, uh, oftentimes, settlers will go in there, sometimes by themselves, and that creates a big ruckus, and sometimes with uh, you know, an Israeli kind of... Uh, uh, troop guarding them. Um, but if I'm arrested in Area A, the Palestinians can only detain me and then hand me over to the Israelis. Or take, for example, you as a tourist. If you go on a South African passport to Israel and you are arrested doing some sort of bad thing, the Palestinian Authority has no control over you. They don't issue you a visa to be in Palestine. It's the Israelis that are controlled, right? Uh, it's just, it's just a, a colorful example of how some of this kind of stuff operates. And we can explore it more if you're interested. Um, what I was saying is, you know, coming to South Africa, you know, and there's all of this conversation about the history of South Africa vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and I understand how stigmatized the apartheid debate is. But again, stressing these politics of the status quo and how honest Israeli politicians are and how they really do show their endgame. You can look at statements made by Ehud Barak and Ehud uh, Olmert in the last three years in which they say openly, and these are, um, I'm quoting basically verbatim, um, if the two-state solution ends, or if it no longer becomes a reality, Israel will be administering an apartheid state over the Palestinians. These are their comments, right? Um, and so I think it's very instructive to think about that and think about this debate about apartheid that's happening inside of Israeli society and how they view the situation. Um, when talking about Israel. I don't think it's a very good space for people to be mudslinging Israel's apartheid state, Israel's not apartheid. I don't think that's very productive. But if we have Israeli Prime Minister saying this in the public record, and we have Avigdor Lieberman saying, we're not going to end the conflict, we're going to manage it. Meaning, explicitly, we will administer the occupation forever, or until something else happens, then we have to take these, these people at face value. We have to say um, that this is this is the idea that they have in governing the state, and that they really, based on these, these, this factual discourse and the fact that the settlements don't stop uh, being created, and that the occupation does not stop entrenching itself, that this is a reality that, um, that Israelis um, have come to live with. Um, and you know, I wrote a lot about the social justice movement uh, that happened in Israel um, two years ago, the, the so-called J14 protests, uh, from this vantage point which I think that this is another very instructive um, example of where Israel is now, in which you have 500,000 Israelis. Uh, this is the equivalent of like, what, 17 million Americans, right, on the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, demanding social justice uh, and ignoring the occupation. And I understand that, the, that it was difficult for them to bring this up, and I understand that there was a very... Um, in-depth debate about, you know, is it time to talk about the occupation, is it not? But in the end of the day, they decided that it wasn't time and it, it wasn't right for them to talk about the occupation. So if you have 500,000 Israelis demanding such a progressive uh, idea as social justice for all, for the nation, for the people, unwilling to talk about the occupation, then I don't see how we can understand Israel as being in a position of uh, ending the occupation. I don't see where uh, we have a willingness or a party inside of Israeli society uh, with the power enough to, to influence the debate and end the situation as it, exi as it exists today. That's not to say that there are, are not many Israelis that are very uh, interested in ending the occupation, and there is that debate. I'm talking about a significant enough force that's going on. Now, I also want to make uh, uh, a brief comment on the Israeli elections just inside of this, this realm of status quo. And then, because it's such a small group, I think we should open it up for questions. Um, you know, the Israeli elections this year were really, really quite interesting because of one of the main issues that was being discussed, and that was um, the economy and internal politics for Israelis, right? I mean, I don't know if you have been following, but this is one of the real issues. And as someone that's living in the region, 
and seeing the dramatic developments that are happening all around Israel's borders, in which you have the Muslim Brotherhood ruling Egypt, you have Syria that's teetering on the brink of collapse any day now, with a chemical weapons arsenal that they have now confirmed in existence. You have Hezbollah sitting with thousands of rockets pointed at Israeli cities. You have Hamas, which is slowly becoming a recognized uh, or more recognized uh, political player in the situation insofar as the Qatari government is investing money in, in, with Hamas and you know there's high, high profile visits. You have these dramatic changes that are really shaking the balance of geopolitics in the Middle East and yet Israelis have an election and they want to talk about internal issues and they want to talk about the economy. So first off that kind of shakes my resolve as to the security narrative which dominates Israeli discourse and dominates what we think about Israel, right? And it makes me question, has the status quo, has the, you know, there was a, a very peculiar terror attack that happened in Jerusalem, I believe it was two years ago, in which a pipe bomb was left at a, um, at a bus stop, a very busy bus stop in Jerusalem, and a British woman was killed during this, during this attack. And Netanyahu came on, on television that night and he said, I have been presiding over the big quiet. You all know that it has been quiet here under my rule. We have been doing okay vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian violence, right? And I think that this big quiet or the perception of the big quiet has really taken such a hold inside of Israeli society. The status quo, because that's what we are talking about, this humming along status quo, uh, has taken such a hold that these dramatic events are not being, uh, at least publicly, uh, based on, on voter patterns, you know, engaged with enough. And that's a very scary principle. And I think that is uh, a kind of byproduct of administering um, such a, a military occupation as Israel does. You know, and you had murmurings of this during the, the last Lebanon war in 2006, in which there were all sorts of Israeli reservists that were underprepared, they didn't have equipment, they were bringing their own equipment. And there were some murmurings in the Israeli press that, well, wait a second, you know, we're administering, our army is basically operating most of the time as this kind of glorified police force, you know, containing um, oppressed Palestinians in the West Bank that have no recourse to that much. Uh, and, and, you know, we're losing sight of our position in the Middle East. And so it's quite, it's quite a dangerous time vis-a-vis um, -vis that perspective. And uh, those are the kind of issues that I just wanted to put on the table to kind of discuss and, 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 and flesh out. Does anyone have any questions? Does it turn the question? Would you like one-on-one, um, -on -one, or would you like a round of questions? Uh, we, it's small enough that we could do one-on-one. -on -one. Is that okay. okay with everyone? As long as everybody just, uh, agrees that inside voices and respectful discourse, then I think we continue. Yeah, I think so. Yeah? Okay, so Ron Penny. Okay, you said you quoted uh, El Dolmert and Ruth Barak saying that if the two-state solution prospect disappears, there's a part of it. But we know that um, in the last 20 years, especially in the last 10 years, there hasn't been any move towards a two-state solution. So in fact, what is known as the peace process is actually a mechanism of entrenching the occupation. And what allows Israel to get away with um, its control is the fact that there is this illusion that something is going on. And as long as this illusion is maintained, um, it, they can say, well, look, we are still discussing it, we are moving. Endless we negotiations. And there is endless negotiations for their own sake. They don't lead anywhere, and there is no, not the slightest <coughs> prospect of them leading anywhere. But this can only continue as long as the Palestinian side continues to play its role in the, in the bargain. Now, being based in Ramallah, where the Palestinian Authority is centered, why do you think they continue to play alone? Um, and is there any prospect that at some point they will say, enough, we are not getting anywhere, our, our, our position becomes worse and worse by the day, and we actually serve continue to play this role that allows Israel to maintain the illusion as if something is happening. When will they put a stop to it? That's an absolutely fantastic question. And it's very interesting because the way that you framed it is exactly the way that many Palestinians in Ramallah frame that question. And the reason I say that is because there is, there is an awareness 
that the Palestinian Authority, and a growing awareness of that, that the Palestinian Authority is operating as a subcontractor for Israeli occupation. Um, now, this is especially strong within the activist communities, within the leftist communities, um, but I think that it's because of this really endless, quite depressing process of reconciliation that's going nowhere, I think that you're starting to see it slip into more mainstream Palestinian society. Now, we have to keep in mind something. The Palestinian Authority, as we know it now, is not going in a way. It's not going away. It's, it has been created um, in such a way with such participation by the Israelis and the Americans um, that it's, there's too much vested interest uh, going on. And you have to couple that with the introduction of a very predatory form of American capitalism insofar as the easily available uh, loans and things like that that are flooding Palestinians. And so many Palestinian friends that I have, they're in $100,000 worth of debt. Um, I know a couple of the nicer restaurants in Ramallah, which are quite nice, I must say, they are quite nice. Uh, one of them is called Orjawan, it's in $700,000 debt. Um, debt that are, it's going through, you know, basically American channel, American banks. Uh, and this was uh, an unusual development. I mean, this is not how it's always been. There hasn't been this culture of easily accessible loans and things like that. This is, a, is, is quite recent. And you couple that with the donor economy, which also does contribute to this very fragile status quo. Um, and you have real economic issues that keep this situation in place. Now, the only thing that I could see really, really changing this, and I'm not um, necessarily saying that it will change it, is the fact that Mahmoud Abbas is quite old. He's an older Palestinian guy. He smokes two packs of cigarettes a day. He's not going to be around for very long. And so I can report that a lot of, there's been a lot of murmuring as to what comes next. I mean, this is an ongoing debate, but it's really kicked up in the last couple of months. Uh, the conspiracy theories that he has prostate cancer or whatnot, that's beside the point. But there is a real fear that when Abbas uh, steps down or dies or something like that, that um, there will be a chaotic security situation on the West Bank. Certain actors uh, will try and uh, exploit that situation, forcing Israel to try in and bring back someone like Mohammed Dahlan or some Palestinian strongman that will be able to um, you know, create a very strong Palestinian state. And I'm reporting this story from well-known, I mean, this is what I'm hearing from well-known, respected Palestinians on the West Bank, intellectuals, lawyers, whatnot. Uh, and so there's that real fear. I think there was another part of your question as to when are they actually going to be able to stand up and say no more negotiations. And that, I don't think, will happen. I don't think it's been engineered that way. Uh, this is a very classic um, tenet of colonialism, to uh, enrich a certain segment of the, of the natives beyond belief and have them administer uh, the colonial regime. And the Palestinian Authority has done that in, a, in an incredibly efficient way. So that if you go to one of the demonstrations that you, you've seen on Fridays that happen in the West Bank, you go through Palestinian checkpoints before you go through Israeli ones. Um, and the Palestinians are brutal. And you saw murmurings of this. Uh, Mufaz was recently uh, in, in Ramallah last fall, and there were some very, very big clashes between Palestinians and um, Palestinian security forces, right? And let's keep in mind, who are these security forces? Who are they trained by? These are trained by this famous General Dayton in Jordan. I mean, General Dayton is an American. I mean, they are, they are well, well trained, well equipped, and tasked with making sure that 10,000 people don't show up at a checkpoint outside of Jerusalem. But as, as I was noting to you earlier, one of the, I think this is a personal um, position here, one of the more disturbing things that I've seen unfold is that smaller radical organizations, not Hamas, but Islamic Jihad, are starting to exploit a certain space of organization in the West Bank specifically. And so if you look at the, the hunger strike uh, situation, which is now back in the news, but it really came into the news big time last year this time with Hadar Adnan, who was on a hunger strike protesting administrative detention by Israel, detention without trial from the old apartheid days, if you'd like. Um, 
he was protesting that he went on hunger strike for what, I don't know, 80 days, 100 days, it was very long, and a lot of the, the leftists on social media really championed this guy as this really great non-violent act against the Israelis and whatnot, but he is a spokesman for Islamic Jihad. He, he did his first hunger strikes against the Palestinian Authority in PA jails, right? Uh, and so the situation is not stable, but it's being controlled, and this is part of the status quo, in my opinion. And you see it with. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. There's a lot of different. Uh, there's a lot of different ep episodes in which you see this. There's been a number of really serious raids happening in Janine that the Palestinian Authority are going in. I was in Janine a couple of weeks ago doing a story about the Freedom Theater, and I went through three checkpoints to get into Janine with mass soldiers, and they were all Palestinian Authority soldiers, right? They weren't Israelis. Uh, and so that city is very volatile. So these places are not stable, but it's all being held together in a certain kind of weird constellation. And that's why I think that if a boss was to die or something like that, then you will see some really <coughs> strong movement. But I want to make one final comment on a boss and how effective um, the, the Palestinian Authority has been for, um, for the two-state solution. Is that when they went to the United Nations, I, I think that and again, this is, a, this is a personal comment. I think that the two-state solution died at the United Nations um, when the Palestinians got statehood uh, recognition. And so I think that it will go down in history, I'm speculating, that the Palestinian Authority, led by Mahmoud Abbas, was in fact the last, the last group that was fighting for the two-state solution. Um, and uh, that demonstrates a, a real, you know, he's, he's worked very very hard in his role, whatever that role may be, as a subcontractor or whatever, but he has worked very hard. So, another question? Yeah, Paul, um, in your view, do you see Israel ending the, the occupation? What are the odds? Or what do you, what, what, what need to happen in Israel for Israel, in particular, not Palestine, but mm -hmm. Israel to end the occupation? It's a really good question, and I think that this does strike, it gets to the heart of a certain consciousness in, inside of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the occupation, in which the, the sort of cognitive dissonance that has been employed by Israelis in understanding the occupation has resulted um, in, in a very difficult separation in the Israeli mind between the occupation and, and, and Israel. Um, you know, one example of this is the, the, the labeling issue, the settlement la goods labeling thing that South Africa appears to be passing somewhat soon. Um, I, I think that this is a very um, interesting decision because it does conform with what with what governments should do. Governments have the right, or the they're me, they're, they have the mandate to inform the citizens of what they're buying and what they're not buying and where it comes from. But I think from the Israeli mindset, they're very afraid that if if they have to start labeling settlement goods, they have to start realizing how mixed up everything is between the occupation and Israel. So if you take SodaStream, for example, which has been the target of the big boycott campaign, you know, this is a device that's, that's manufactured in the West Bank, and this is like a very contentious thing. But parts of it are manufactured in Tel Aviv, or outside Tel Aviv. You know, if you want to buy an Israeli tomato, you don't know if it's coming from the West Bank or from Israel. Right? I mean, it's all mixed up, and I think that mixed up in terms of good is also inside of the mindset. So in order for Israelis to end the occupation, there has to be that, that sort of realization of what the occupation really is. You know, there's a very good book written by an uh, Israeli sociologist named Yehuda Shanhav. It's a translation of his book about the Green Line that came out in Hebrew, in which he's arguing, you know, in a basic level, that the Green Line has been erased inside of the Israeli consciousness, and at this point, um, it exists really as a demarcation between some Palestinians that have no rights and some Palestinians that have a couple rights. Um, and so in order for Israel to end the occupation, there first has to be a discussion about it. And again, going back to the social justice movement, in which you have people, and I wouldn't harp on this if it wasn't under the umbrella of social justice. You have Israelis that are really well-meaning, you know, probably kind of liberal people that want are demanding social justice, and then they get very angry when you say, well, wait a second, what, what about the occupation? What about the Palestinians? Oh, well, that, that, just leave us alone. We're, you know, we have our right to talk about uh, our own internal society, and they do. But if that's the case, if the leftists that are demanding social justice don't want to engage in this issue, what do you think the prospects of them ending the occupation are going to be? I, I think that at this point we've moved into a situation 
And maybe the occupation shouldn't end. Maybe that's not what should happen. I don't know what the solution should be, and I don't have a solution. Maybe it should be, as you were mentioning, a confederation. Maybe it should be a one state. Maybe it should be all of these things. But in order to get close to ending the occupation in two-state paradigm, there has to be more discussion inside of the Israeli mindset. And I just don't see that there right now. Hello, Joseph. Hello. I'm Yazid. I'm a journalist from Tokyo. I'm just visiting China to get the moment. Nice to meet you. Cool. Um, the question I have um, this I don't like this proposal of against solutionism, mm -hmm. this stance. Um, it kind of like, it seems once again like the unilateral Israeli narrative of the situation and, and the way forward. And in a way, it's almost already taking a resolution. You know? So um, the question is, and also it's very really right wing. It seems like it's more like a right wing thing, it's mm. against solutionism. So the question from, from me is, I'm really curious to know what is the Palestinian reaction to this? Can you tell us what are your friends saying about Palestinian? About what? About the stance of against the... It's not a stance. It was just a topic that was designed to ensure that someone would want to ask a question like that. <laughs> right? But I mean, is there, I think is that there a there sense are... of amongst the Israeli or Palestinian friends that this is sort of like, I mean, clearly it's, it's part of the narrative now. Right? I think that the narrative is changing, okay? I think that this is really one of the most interesting developments that is happening on the ground. That the Israeli narrative, which is effectively adopted in the West, mm -hmm. that this is a conflict about peace and security. That this is a conflict between two sides that have relatively equal proportions, right? Israel has a king, uh, the Palestinians have a prime minister and, pr and president, and there's two kind of weird governments, and that this is how it's going, that this is this linear fashion. I think that that narrative... Um, is dying. And I think that the narrative that is being replaced is a narrative of, is a rights-based discourse. And so in a perfect example of how this is being replaced in such a profound way is the nomination of Five Broken Cameras for the Academy Awards, which is a film that is about Palestinians in Benin struggling for their, their, their rights to livelihood, for their land. The fact that the Academy Awards has nominated this film is a very, very strong indication that people are, are entertaining the fact that rights plays a very big role as opposed to just peace and security, right? It's not the first film coming from the region to the world. I didn't say it was the first yeah. film. I said it was the... And what, they didn't read, by the way, just by the way. It, the Academy Awards haven't happened yet. I know, I'm saying, like, just looking at the track record. But sorry, I'm just interpreting that. Okay, well, I'm saying that this film, because of its content, okay. not the fact that they're nominating a Palestinian film, okay. because of its content, demonstrates the fact that the narrative is changing. And also, the democratization of discourse, is that the, the discourse has been, been set up in a sort of way, especially in the media, uh, in which this narrative has been privileged, this narrative of peace and security. And social media specifically has really, I think, upended some of that. And that has been pushed on by the, by the Arab revolutions, and it's happening, you know, much more um, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? And so this, against solutionism, as I said, it's borrowed from Naftali Bennett. And what I'm trying to do is report as to what the conversation is happening there. And I think that this is, the, this is a very, very prominent theme inside of Israeli political discourse in which they don't want to have a solution, necessarily. It's not that they don't want it, but they don't feel it's, it's um, going to happen. And that the solution is the management of the conflict. The solution is the perpetuation of the occupation. The solution is X, Y, and Z. And we are leading to a situation in which, because of the failure of the peace process, because of the fact that the Americans have not provided really significant leadership in, in managing this peace process, that international pressure um, in whatever form will likely be what is necessary in order to shake the Israeli resolve into action. Um, and I think that many Israelis are very, very afraid of that because they realize that it's, you know, the Israeli uh, imagination is very much connected to, to Europe. Um, it's a lifeline to Europe. You, know, you have the old famous statements from from early um, uh, Israeli politicians, you know, like, I, I forget who, you probably remember, you know, we are a villa in the jungle, right? That's Barak. Barak? It would Barak. No, but there was an old, uh, I think it would, he borrowed that from someone in the 50s. 
Could be. Anyway, but there is that, that, okay. that imagination <laughs> that, that, that Israel is an outpost of, of, of Europe in the Middle East and that they are a villain that would use their words. And they are definitely afraid of losing those links. You know, it's interesting talking to boycott activists and, and hearing about what, what is good and what is bad. But because when you look at it compared with the Israeli reaction, you see things like when Sipi Livni couldn't go to the United Kingdom because of the universal jurisdiction law, this was making huge waves in the Israeli press. This really shook the Israeli resolve. We can't go to the United Kingdom, right? Like, if you cut down those, those bridges, or if, if those bridges are somehow put on the table as something that could be applied as, as pressure, I think that that is really um, going to, to shake the Israeli resolve. I mean, I think they're going to go back into a much more defensive position, but I think that there's a big fear, and that's why when you have the settlement labeling, and the, right now the, the boycott is, I mean, relatively small in terms of how it's affecting the Israeli economy. The Israeli economy is in, in a pretty good shape considering the global financial crisis. Um, but they're afraid that the ball is going to get rolling and that this is going to be something that's going to get out of their control. Um, and so that's the, the flip side of the against solutionism. How do you shake the status quo? I don't have the answer. I'm just I'm, I'm posing the question to think about. There is a status quo that exists in Israel-Palestine, right? And it's almost formulaic at this point, especially even, even in, in, in the violence that's happening in Gaza. This is also somewhat formulaic. Um, and so how do you break that, that cycle? Because it's not helping anybody. I mean, really, in the end of the day, it's not helping the Israelis. It's not helping the Palestinians. How do you break it? I don't have the answer, but these are the questions that I was hoping to raise in terms of intellectual beacons. Um, I quite liked your analysis of the of the PA and how you said that it's a typ typical kind of colonial regime, which with with an elite that benefits from donor economy and with all this vested interest and so on. I, I agree with this analysis, but at the same time, I think that there has to be, the PA has to be, there's something that the PA intended to do, that Salam Fayyad intended to do, which also has at least good intentions in the sense that I think if the PA, because the idea of Salam Fayyad was to create institutions to, to assure security so that the Israelis would have less of an argument to go into the occupied mm -hmm. territories and less of an, less of an argument in, the, in fact 